Now, let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And I may not get as far as I wanted to get. How many of you would like me to stop when it's time to stop? Well, I don't know what time it is to stop, but uh, I, I promise I'll get, you, I'll get you out in time tonight. Philippians chapter 3. And uh, we're going to start tonight in chapter 3 in verse 17. Title of our study has been Our Joy, Our Life, and Our Unity. And this evening, the, if you want to look at it, if you need a title every time you know, somebody gets up to preach, I would call this tonight The Joyful Walk. And we're going to go right up to chapter uh, 4, verse 1. But we're going to talk about following Jesus. Oh, wow, that's new, isn't it? So all we talk about here is following Jesus. But, but you and I know that we're following somebody. We're all either following somebody or somebody's idea through life, or somebody's ism or somebody's philosophy. It might be, might be a person who's a role model to you and you're following, you're tracking along with them, but we're all following somebody and somebody, somebody's idea or something. And so as we start tonight in, in verse 17 to 19, I want you to read along with me. If you'd like to read out loud, you're welcome to do that, but, but if not, Listen carefully as we begin. Verse 17, and it says this. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now I tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Father, that's a good warning to start out with tonight. And we thank you, Father, for the directions you've given us in life so we don't have to wander and we really truly can follow you. I thank you for the clarity of your word, Lord. I thank you for Paul's boldness and his attentiveness to the details of that church there in Philippi that he was so far away from at that moment. And so, Lord, help us to learn from what he said to them as it relates to us even down to this day in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 How many of you are thankful that the Christian life is not just some religious routine? Anybody grew up with a, a religious routine? Did they, did anybody like me, you knew when you were supposed to be there, you knew when to sit, when to stand, when to kneel, which way to cross yourself when you crossed yourself and, and, and all of that. But for too many, it still is a religious routine. It was never meant to be that. It was meant to be far more than just a weekly schedule. And well, here we are. Aren't we on, on a religious routine tonight? Isn't this a weekly schedule? It's much deeper than that, I hope, for you. I know it is for me beyond a weekly routine and some set of discipline or a list of things that we don't do anymore. How how many of you, if I was to say, what don't you do anymore that you used to do before you came to Jesus, you'd have a list. Anybody? Okay, there's a few of you. Um, But the Christian life is more than a list of what I don't do anymore. It's more than than a, a, a list on what goes on my weekly schedule. And even though all of those things have their place, I mean, is anybody here besides me glad that I don't do drugs anymore? It's not on my list anymore. I, I don't do those. Uh, is anybody here okay with me not swearing anymore? It probably makes it a little bit more pleasant for you as you, as you come in and open your Bible. Anybody glad that I don't steal your stuff when I visit your house? <laughs> I was dangerous. I was, a, I was dangerous to your stuff. It was just this compulsion that I have. So if you're missing a James Taylor album, it wasn't me. I didn't take it. If you're missing a a Billy Joel album, it might be my daughter Bethany who stole that from you. She's really into Billy Joel LPs right now. Kidding, kidding, of course. But yes, my schedule is different. And And I love hanging out with you now. I love being with the people of God. I love the opportunities that I get to, to reach out in his name like Stephanie's doing in Paris. Anytime I get to, to go from here to there, whether there is across the street and I know that there's a divine encounter that God set up, I come away from those just smiling that, God, you did that. And that happened to me today. I was over across the, the street and I was grabbing something really quick for lunch and when I came out of... Uh, of uh, the uh, Whole Foods there with a little, little, bit, little bit of lunch in a plastic box to bring back here and, and, and have my lunch, I saw this very familiar face. 
And Joy and I have known this, this, uh, this man for oh, probably 15, 16, 17 years. He used to work at a restaurant that was right down the street called Coco's. Anybody remember Coco's? It was on the corner of Gothard there. And he was just the most uh, amazing server. And he could remember everything you said without having to write it down. He was just incredible. But he's a, he's a man who really loves the Lord. And in our conversation, brilliant too, just absolutely brilliant. His name is Steve. And in our conversation, some things popped up that I knew this was, this was God who put this thing together. This, this little encounter. And all I had to do to go, and, and it was really more about something I needed to receive at that moment, information that I needed that Steve had in his amazing brain. And I, it was just, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm wondering on this. I didn't write this down, but it just came to me that God is in charge of our, movings, our, our movements, isn't he? Yes. He goes before us and he sets something up. And I, I love that about this walk with Jesus Christ. It's it's, it's you know, stepping into something that he has organized long before I got out of bed that morning. It wasn't on my schedule, but he did it. And I love that about God. My schedule is different. I get to do things like that now. And God organizes that. My, my priorities have changed. But the Christian life is far more than just a new routine. It's about a new set of relationships that you have. As a follower of Jesus Christ, new relationships with Father God, because Jesus gave his life to clear your debt so that the doorway was open for you to step into this magnificent relationship with a God, as Stephanie was saying, a God who loves you and doesn't just have this endless you know, role of, of, of mandates for you. It's just, oh, you know what God says to you every day? Follow me. Follow me, walk with me. Let's take a walk today. Doesn't that make it so simple? I really, really believe that that's what it's all about. I, I love that, that this, this thing that we like to call Christianity, which isn't a word you find in the Bible, surprisingly enough, it's a relationship, a new set of relationships with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, a very real and literal relationship with Jesus, a very real relationship with the Holy Spirit. And if you learn to, to discern those whispers and those nudges of the Spirit, you, you step into some just amazing opportunities to either shine light on somebody or receive from someone a word that will just change your life, change your day, refresh you. And I, I love that about the Lord. But it's, it, the other part of the relationship is this new thing that we call the church, this new family called the church. This is where it gets both exciting and difficult. Have you noticed that? Family is fun and family can be, well, what would you say? Challenging. <laughs> can be work. Yes, it can be fun. It can be work. And, and m- most relationships are that way. There's a little bit of those in each one. But it's exciting because it means that we're not alone. We, we, we weren't called into isolation as Christians. We were called into a family. We were all born into this family that was already filled with brothers and sisters who were already there when we arrived. How many of you are the oldest in your family? I mean, the firstborn. Firstborn, firstborn married firstborn. How about that? How many of you are second and below? That obviously has to be the rest of us if you were listening to the former question. But, but even the oldest among us was born into this family that was already full of people. When the Christian family came into existence on that day of Pentecost, those were the first. That was the first wave, the first tier. But all of us, we come into a family that is already filled with brothers and sisters. And so this is our tribe. This is our family. And and you have the advantage of coming into a family that already has legacy, has heroes and as some, the other, whatever the opposite of heroes is, there's some of, the, some of us in there too. But it's, it's a family that has something to do for Jesus. And there's elders and there's mothers and fathers. And there's all the, this just endless siblings in the family of God and those who can help you grow and help you go for the Lord. Go with you to places that he's saying, would you go do this for me? You know, any mission, any mission, is just God whispering to your soul and saying, would you go do this for me? Would you go love that person for me? Would you go love the people of Melbourne, Australia for me, Andrew and Nikki, and Christian and Josh? 
Would you go love the people of, of France and all of their other languages, Stephanie and, and the whole team that's there? Would you go love your wife and your husband for me? Would you go love those kids for me? And, and, and that's the mission of our life is just to do the next thing that God puts before us as he moves us out in this world. Well, Paul is one of those big brothers. And I love the way he speaks here to the people in that church in Philippi that he had planted. As a big brother, he makes a very, very strong suggestion to them. Look at it again there in verse 17. He says, brethren, join in following my example and note those who walk so. In other words, those who walk like me as you have us for an example. So Paul says, I, I, I have a strong suggestion for you. And here's what it is. Here's what I would call this, this section of the, what we're looking at tonight. Choose your mentors wisely. And so Paul says, be careful who you follow. And he gives us a suggestion on who to follow. It's a, such a humble suggestion. He says, follow me. Follow me. And he would say, in, in other places he would say, and we'll see him in a moment, follow me as I what? As I'm following Jesus. But, but Paul said, I, I want you to choose your mentors wisely. And he gives this contrast in mentor options. He said, you can follow me. More, more on that in a minute. He said, or you can follow those that he's probably speaking about, those he already mentioned in chapter one. Flip back to chapter one, just for a moment. One and a half pages back. Verse 14, he says there, most of the brethren in the, in the Lord have become confident by my chains and are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. I won't dig back into that. We covered that, but it sounds crazy, doesn't it? That somebody would preach the gospel out of envy and out of strife, hoping to make life harder for Paul. But he said some out of goodwill. He says the former, verse 16, the former preached Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love. He said, choose your mentors wisely. He said, watch out for those that are just in it for themselves to build their own empire or their fortune, selfishly motivated leaders. But Paul would say, you can follow me and I will not mislead you. And he suggests, I want you to, to follow my example. And that is confidence. That's, he's not getting cocky here. He's not arrogant. He's saying, you can trust me. I will not mislead you. There's, uh, I think I've shared this recently. When I do weddings, uh, one of the phrases that I have in the vows that the, the couple will say back and forth to one another is this little phrase. They look their beloved in the eye and they say one by one, you're safe with me. You're safe with me. That's so important, isn't it, in a marriage, that you're safe with me. Your heart is safe with me. You are safe with me. And that's what Paul is saying to the, to the believers there in, in Philippi. Now, he's saying, follow my example. He's 400 to 500 miles away as the crow flies, about 750 miles as the road meanders its way there. How in the world can they follow him? Well, they knew what he was like. They saw how he is, is in one of his letters. He said, I will both spend and I will be spent to minister to you. Oh, Paul would dig down deep in his own resources. He would be on the mission field making tents and canvas bags for people and backpacks for people. He would be using the craft that he'd learned as a kid to put food on the table and a roof over his head. He said, I will spend and I will be spent. I'll let God ring me out for you. They knew what kind of a man he was. And he said, follow my example. That's what Paul is saying. I can show you how to follow Jesus by the example I laid behind. Paul said it a lot where he was saying, in one way or another, you're safe with me. Look at these verses. In 1 Corinthians, he said, for even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. So I urge you, say it with me, imitate me. Walk like I walked. He said this later on in the same letter. You should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Mimic me, in other words. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 6. Read this with me out loud, okay? This will just wake up anybody who just needs a little nudge to wake up tonight. Here we go. You receive the message with joy from the Holy Spirit 
in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. You know what? I, I see a story behind there. As the Thessalonians were going through hard times, I can just picture them as they gathered maybe secretly in, in, a, in, a, in somebody's home or in their atrium or wherever they would gather the, the groups of believers. And they'd say, man, it's, it's so tough. Boy, life is tough. There's a song that came to mind uh, this morning, and I, I shared it with the, um, our, our staff meeting today. And it was a song from way back, I think in the maybe late 80s, early 90s, and I think it was from Amy Grant. And Joy and I have, it comes to mind for us from time to time, and it goes like this. It goes, we believe in God, and we all need Jesus, because life is hard. And it might not get easier. Boy, that phrase has always hit me. There's no promise that it will get easier. In fact, Jesus, and we're going to talk about that this Sunday in Mark chapter 12. Jesus told his disciples, life's going to be hard for you guys. It's going to be very hard. Tribulation is going to come your way, and you'll be hated. And some of you will die for your faith. It might not get easier in this life. But then there's the best life, not just the next life, but the best life. And so I can picture these Thessalonians uh, imitating Paul when, when they were under severe suffering. It's not just a mild headache. That's persecution. He said, in this way, you imitated both us. And I can hear one Thessalonian saying to the other Thessalonian, you know, Paul went through stuff like this, and he made it through. He trusted Jesus. It's important to have those kind of stories in your heart and mind. Read, read missionary stories. Pick up a, oh, from, a great, great book. From Jerusalem, that's the easy part, to Irian Jaya. And it's just a marvelous book of little snippet type stories of, of missionaries. And many of those, you would never have heard of them, what they endured for the sake of the gospel. So that when you're in a hard time, you can say, you know what? Moffat made it through this. C.T. Studd made it through this. I could go on and on and on and on on names. Amy, Carma, I mean, Amy Carmichael made it through this. Even after she had that, that terrible fall and the rest of her life was spent in, in a dark room because of the pain and, and, and much of it bedridden, some of her most incredible poetry came out of those times. So that's, I, I believe that's what he's saying with the Thessalonians. One more in Hebrews chapter 6. Let's read together. Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. Yes, sometimes life is hard and it might not get easier quickly. But Paul was not saying... When he said, follow me, he wasn't saying, hey, watch me from the stands or follow me on Instagram. He says, walk the way that I walk. He wasn't saying, watch me run. He wasn't saying, applaud for me as I go do the hard work. He was saying, join me on the field. Join me on the track. Join me on the trail. He says, let me coach you. Let's do something for, for Jesus together. And he, he took a lot of apprentices, apprentices with him on the original hiking tours of Israel and Turkey and Europe. He'd say, come on, walk with me to the field. And that's how they would get there typically. And they walked with him and he mentored them and they went on to do great things for Jesus. The so question for, for me and for us tonight is, can I say those things? Follow me as I follow Jesus. When people are wanting to know what it means to follow Jesus, can I say, well, if you follow me, I can teach you what it means. I can show you what it means to follow Jesus. Not just give you five bullet points on what you ought to do, but I can say, just walk with me. Let's go into this together. That's really what mentoring, coaching, and discipleship is really all about. Can I say that? Follow me as I follow Jesus. I'll show you what it means to follow Jesus. And if I can't, I mean, it may, it may be, maybe in your mind, somebody's in here thinking, I don't know if I could say that right now. Let me hit you with a follow-up question. Why not? Why can't you at this point in your life say to someone who's wondering what Christianity is all about, well, walk with me. I'll show you what it's all about. 
follow me as I'm following Jesus. And maybe your answer to the if not, why not, could be something like, well, I'm, I'm just getting started as a Christian. I'm just a baby Christian. I know that feeling, but I tell you, that's the perfect time to reach out to an old friend and follow Jesus closer and closer and closer to somebody while you're still, while, you're, while it's brand new in you and you're on fire for Jesus. That's a great time to include somebody else. Bring along maybe a workmate. And, and if you've just begun, invite a friend to come along too. As you're beginning to discover all that it means to, to, to follow Jesus and to walk with him and then find someone to coach and mentor and disciple you. If, if the answer is no, I'm not sure, then find somebody who's ahead of you and say, can you help me? How do you, how do, you do devotions? How do you read the Bible on your own? Tell me about this thing called prayer. I'm not sure if I'm saying the right words. Did anybody ever kind of hold back in prayer, especially in a, in a public prayer circle, maybe even like tonight, because you thought, I'm not sure I'll say it quite right. Let me see the hands of those who have ever done something like that. I'll never forget this one prayer meeting. is when I was on staff at a, a Foursquare church out in uh, uh, Palm Springs. And, and Joy and I and our family were involved with them for about three years, I think, wasn't it, hon? Before we moved to Australia. And we had a men's prayer meeting, a men's breakfast, and, and a prayer time this one morning. And, you know, just anybody that wanted to pray would pray out loud. And this one guy, his name was Jimmy. And uh, he was a great guy. He was in construction. And, and uh, so he starts praying, and he, he prayed for the whole world, you know, just like that. Lord, bless the whole world, you know. And you might want to get a little more specific. But he, he went, you know, he did about five or six or, or eight different little prayer points, and then he hesitated for a moment. He said, and God, and God um, um, bless yourself too. Bless yourself, God. And everybody was kind of probably holding back laughter. But you know what? I think God enjoyed hearing that. From someone who was learning to pray out loud and pray in a group like that, do you think God understood Jimmy's heart when he said, oh, God, go ahead and bless yourself too while you're at it, blessing everything else? don't hold back. Step out. You probably can pray better than you think you can pray. But if you need help, you feel like you're at a place in your walk with Jesus where you need some help, then ask God to, to bring you a mentor. Ask God to bring you someone that will just coach you and, and disciple you and help you along. And you'll both be growing. Give yourself to that growth process. I mean, give yourself to it. Like, like you would if you, were, you decided, I am going to learn to play the ukulele. It's, I, I just need, I'm, I was going to do guitar, but it's two less strings, so I'm going to start with a ukulele. But I really want to learn it. And if you really want to learn it, you're going you're gonna to practice. And you're going to build up some, what? Some calluses. So it doesn't hurt when you press the strings down. And you'll get better and better and better as you give yourself to it, as you watch and you ask questions and you practice, practice, practice. Walk along with others that are in, a, in, in that growth mode as well. And you will grow strong. And then go help somebody else. Find somebody who's maybe a step or two behind and help them catch up. So, show someone how to read the Bible the way that you do. Coach another friend in a devotional pattern. Pray with somebody. Study the Bible together. You, you don't need permission to do that. You have permission. You have a Bible. You've got permission. Read the Bible with somebody else and compare notes with one another. Um, learn to share your faith. Take a buddy to church with you or to an evangelistic event or, to, or on a missions trip. When you, next time you hear, hey, we're going to get a group of people and we're going to take some, some uh, supplies down to Mexico or to wherever, you know, even on this side of the border, jump on that and go out with some other people as they're doing something for Jesus together, save up for an Israel tour. It's like a, it, it's like a, a, they say it's like a year in Bible college. And, and just go deeper in your faith and your understanding of the scripture and God's call on your life. This is what that mysterious word, discipleship, is really all about. It's, it's relational and it's life-changing. The solo Christian, so, and I'm talking about maritally solo but the Christian who isolates themselves, they are just, they're just a target for the enemy. You need to be in a pack of brothers and sisters walking this thing out together. It's so absolutely important that we do that. 
But this is, the, discipleship is such a, a, a life-changing thing. When you walk it out together with other believers, it's, it's relational and it's so life-changing. I believe the rest of joys in my life is gonna be focused to a large degree on discipleship and coaching and mentoring and just encouraging other leaders. And, and, I'm, and we're just really learning what that's gonna mean for us. What it's gonna mean to come alongside of, of maybe a, a young couple that are just planting a church somewhere or just stepping out into the mission field. And we've done those things. And I, I think when God pours something into you, he doesn't want to waste those treasures of understanding and knowledge that you have. And so I love the way that Paul says, and he says it over and over, follow me, follow my example. It was with this heart to see himself duplicated and multiplied in so many other different directions, people taking the same principles and going in a different way. So I, I really believe that's gonna be a huge part of what Joy and I get to do for the rest of our life until Jesus comes to take us home. And I'm, I'm so excited about that. Aren't, aren't, aren't you, babe? There's only one babe in the room right now, by the way, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. But a um, couple of questions for you, and then we'll move on, okay? And, and on this whole theme of uh, helping other people grow and somebody helping you grow, who helped you grow as a Jesus follower? You know, I'm not going to ask you to shout them out, but how many, how many of you could shout out a name if I asked you to shout out a name? You said, that was that person. And maybe it was your, your friends or, or, your, or your, your parents or, or your brothers or sisters. Second question is this, who are you helping to grow as a Jesus follower? Who are you coming alongside of? Who do you text to say, how are you doing today? whether they're in your generation or a generation above or below. Who are you encouraging today? The third question is this, it's kind of like the second one, who could use some encouragement from you? And if, if a name, a face pops into your mind, there's your assignment. Maybe before the night is over, to send them an email or a text or leave them a, a, a voicemail. I love it when somebody doesn't pick up a phone call. Not because I don't want to talk to them, but because I get to leave them a message that I hope they're going to want to listen to more than once, an encouragement, a word from God for them. There's one more, one more question up here I have for you. Who do you know who needs Jesus, who's not there yet? They're not in the family of God yet. Don't give up on them. Don't say, well, Greg Laurie's going to get them. He's going he's to pick them off, you know. You, you go after them to begin with. And yeah, you might take them to a harvest crusade. But who do you know who needs Jesus? Start on your knees for them, whether that's metaphorically on your knees, just come before the Lord with them and let their name be on your lips on a daily basis. As they need Jesus, you be the answer to that. It could start by inviting them to, to refuge. It, it could involve going through a small group Bible study with them. It usually will start with a, a courageous conversation. And it has these, these, these four points. I want you to, to think this through with me. As you're starting a conversation with somebody who needs Jesus, and there's a thousand different methods of evangelism, but I'm talking about friend evangelism. A confession, a story, a question, and a gift or two. The confession would be this, that you finally tell them, I love Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christian. They might see the fish on the back of your, your pickup truck or, or the back of your Tesla. And they say, all right, I didn't know that you were a fisherman. And they say, oh, well, do I come out of the woods now or what? Because you remember the fish? You remember what the, how the fish started? They say, and I'm not sure if this is exactly how it started, but in days when it was, was dangerous to, to identify yourself as a Christian, and I think it was during, still under the, the Roman era and during one of those 10 waves of persecution, one, one person would be sitting there or standing there maybe in the marketplace and maybe they had a stick or maybe they did it with the toe of their sandal and they just left a little arc. They just traced out a little arc on the ground and they stepped away from it and if somebody else came up and and they, from the other side, they took their toe and they, nobody's looking and they just traced out another ark and they made a little fish, shape of a fish. It was a way of saying, I'm a Christian. I guess you are too. 
and, and the fish isn't meant to be a secret sign anymore. It's meant to be more of a bold sign. But anyway, you, you identify yourself. You say, I'm a follower of Jesus. It's a confession. I love the Lord. The second thing is your story. You tell them, here's what happened to me. Here's how I, I came to Christ. And you tell them as much as, of your story as you feel you should at any given moment. And then it's a question. Have you read the story of Jesus? Do you know much about Jesus? Or what do you know about Jesus? Oh, there's so many people from so many different cultures that are here in Southern California that have come from other nations and they come w without an understanding of who Jesus is. There's only one Savior. Amen? There's only one way home to heaven. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. And to have the boldness and the love to say, have you read the story of Jesus? Do you, do you know it? And that's where you give them a gift. And the gift that you give them is a gospel. And I would really suggest a gospel. Just give them a gospel. You can get them separately at the bookstore down at Calvary Costa Mesa. You can get them online, a gospel. Whatever your favorite gospel is. Some people say, oh, you got to give them John. Some people say, no, Mark, because it's the shortest one. But just give them a gospel and be ready for a conversation. Say, here, take this and read it, and, and we'll talk about it. And then the second gift is, hey, I'll pick you up on Sunday. You give them a gospel, and then you give them a ride to church with you. And you're starting a, a, a path that just might bring them to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay, look down at verse 20. And uh, I'm not sure how much... I don't know that we're going to get done with all... I, I'm loaded here tonight. I've got more than I can give to you tonight, I think. But in uh, chapter 3, again, in, in uh, Philippians, down at verse 20 and 21, it reads like this. It says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform. And I think, they're, they're, I think before I get done reading this verse, there's going to be some people going, mm-hmm, or hallelujah, who... Who will, Jesus Christ, who will come, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Here's what this is about. It's about changing your passport. Now, I'm, I'm a dual citizen. Anybody else here a dual citizen? I'm a dual citizen. I'm a citizen of America. And I'm a citizen of heaven. My citizenship is in heaven from which I look for, long for, wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus who will change finally everything about me. And some of you probably have one or two or three or five points about me that you'd really love to see the Lord change. And one day, all of that's going to be made right. But for, right, for just a moment, I want to talk politics to you. Nobody's groaning. Some of you are thinking, I'm not coming here anymore if he's going to talk politics here. Here's what I mean. We've got, we got to talk politics. The Greek word for citizenship, our citizenship is pole, poletuma. Everybody try to say that. I'm not sure I said it right, but let's say it wrong together. Poletuma. Poletuma. We get our word politics from that, obviously. It's, it's not the politics that you might expect. And let me explain. Speaking about the politics you might expect... I want to share this with you. I want to get a feel for this as well, by the way. Pastor Jeff and I have been talking around this possibility of occasionally so, showing some current event films here at the, on, on maybe Friday nights or whenever we've got a gap in our schedule. Not partisan rallies, not political partisan rallies, not telling you how to fill in your ballot and who to vote for. That's not my job. We would only choose films that are, are really truly addressing current issues about which the Bible has something to say. I mean, so, something to say in a very, very clear way. I have strong feelings about the Second Amendment. And today I heard people say less guns. And I heard people say more guns. And, and it's just it, 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 that debate is going to get hotter and hotter as time goes by. I have strong feelings about what's happening to the integrity of our system of voting. And many, many people do. And I have no problem addressing those issues on my personal social media or in private conversations. But the Bible has something to say about many, if not most, of the current topics that we follow, what, that we all follow on social media. And I hear a lot of you make comments on those too, on social media. But that, my social media platform is not 
a pulpit. I, I happen to be a, a private citizen as well, and I've had people tell me in the past, well, you're, you're a pastor, so you really shouldn't ever say anything about politics anywhere, anywhere, even over across the street at a coffee shop. And I beg to differ on that. But I protect the pulpit from the politics, especially the partisan politics. I don't think that that's my job. I have no problem addressing it on my social media, like I said, or personal conversations. But the Bible has something to say about all of, I'm, I'm not sure about all, but most of the current topics that we all follow on social media, whether they be LGBT issues or abortion or Roe v. Wade, um, even national leadership. And again, I'm not, I'm not sneaking in to uh, Republican versus Democrat there. I think it has a lot to say about government interference in the moral training of our children. Uh, the, my children are my responsibility to raise, not the government's responsibility to raise. So we might be offering some films that would help us think through some of these current issues. And if, if that's not something that would be up your alley, then you don't have to worry about that happening on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. But if we can't do that, and, and this is the caveat to all of this with me, if we can't do something like that, if we try it and we find out that that the, the family's fighting over things that the family ought not to fight over it, we'll tank that right away. But if, it's, if it turns out to be something that would be helpful to think through, then we'll just see how that goes. But, but that's not the politics I'm talking about here tonight. See that word citizenship in your Bible there? That's this Greek word. And obviously politics comes from that word. And, and here's what it means. In the, in the language that it came out of, not just in, in, in biblical terms, it was speaking about a community or a commonwealth that was established for the common good of all the citizens. And I love the fact that, that, that Paul used that word to talk about where our politics are, the core politics for us. It, it, it's, it's not in the democratic system or the republic, whatever we are, um, the, the, the the family of God has their citizenship in heaven from which we look for our king to come. That's the kingdom of heaven, a community, a country that he's established, a, 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 new, a, a new family of people established for the common good. And our citizenship is registered in heaven. My passports, I have many passports because they have to be retired at a certain time and I got to go refresh them, I think, in another year. But all of those are just very, very temporary passports. My citizenship is secure in heaven. How about yours? In the commonwealth of heaven. And Paul is saying, I want you to understand these three truths from what we just read. Number one is this. This world is not your eternal home. Your citizenship is in heaven. Say that out loud with me. My citizenship is in heaven. I belong to a kingdom, the kingdom of God, because of what Jesus did. He purchased my place in that kingdom. You're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. This kingdom here is temporary. That one is eternal. The second thing is this. Jesus will return for you one day. He is coming back for you. And I believe that time is very, very soon. This is, this is the Jesus is coming portion of the letter to the Philippians. He didn't go deep into that in the letter to the Philippians, but he did say, oh, and by the way, he's coming for you. Your citizenship is there and your king will come for you. So number one, the world is not your eternal home. Secondly, Jesus will return for you. And the third thing he says is that you will soon get an amazing upgrade. Everything about you is gonna be renewed and refreshed. Look, look, look at that portion of it again right here. It says, he will transform your lowly body. How many of you, your lowly body is feeling more lowly all the time? How many of you have a body that cooperates with your wishes less and less and less? I, I told this story. It was probably eight years ago. We were out in the park doing a uh, you know, one of our, our, our uh, church picnics and my granddaughter came through and I think she stole my water bottle. It was Abby and she went off running with my water bottle and I thought, this is easy. I can catch an eight-year-old. And I went running after her and I, I could not close the gap with the eight-year-old. And my lowly body refused to do what I was commanding it to do and it's happening more and more these days, but he, we, we will soon get an upgrade. We will be transformed. 
into his image. And it says conformed to his, look at that one more time. It, that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Here's the question. How's that gonna happen, Pastor Bill? Well, here's Paul's answer. He'll do it according to the working by which he does everything that he does. In other words, what, is it, what does he do? He doesn't answer my question. How is he gonna do that? And it's enough for Paul to just say he's gonna do it like he does everything. And you will be renewed and you, you will be perfected in, in completely done and ready. What could never have fully happened here will happen there. In that moment, in that twinkling of an eye, you will become like Jesus. That's great news. Amen? Amen. I, I refuse to abandon that hope of that, that perfection when I'm conformed and transformed into his image. Now, all of this is, is cause for great rejoicing and for deeper resolve and determination to walk closely with Jesus and to follow Jesus like Paul followed Jesus. But we need to grab this one last verse over in chapter four because it should have been left in chapter three when they did the, the headings. One last verse, here it is. Therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and crown, stand fast in the Lord, my beloved. Stand fast. He's about to wrap up and he's got some problems to solve between a couple of church members who weren't getting along and we'll get, we'll get along to that next week. But he says, so listen to me, my beloved. Look at all these terms of endearment. He said, my beloved, my loved ones, my longed for, my joy. I got a joy. He had a joy. All these, you're my joy and you're my crown. He said, hold on, just hold on <clears throat> under the hardship, under the challenges. He said, stand firm, stand fast in the Lord. I, I love the way Paul gets so parental here. He says, my beloved, my long for, which is saying, oh, I miss you so much. I long to be with you. The separation between us, I hate the separation but I love you. He said, my joy. I think it's a way of him saying, you put a smile on my face when I just think about you. He said, I, I love you so much. My crown, he said, it's like he's saying, you're my reward. My reward is knowing that you're standing firm in this ongoing fight. And, and, and notice how Paul always brought them back to the reminder to focus their life and their, and their walk and their work on the Lord Jesus. He said, bring it right back to Jesus. And don't wander from that. Don't get tired of that. Don't confuse it. Don't, don't wander into a religious, political, whatever, and do damage to the, the core of who you are and what you're here to do. I believe we're to be engaged in every level of our society. And, I, and I'm thankful we live in a nation where we hopefully still get to have our say. But, but my joy and my rejoicing is Jesus. And if it's not, then whatever I'm getting joyful about, whatever I'm looking to for stability, it will wash away in the storms of life. But if Jesus is my joy, if Jesus is, is my source of hope, I'm steady in any storm, whatever happens in whatever election, Whatever happens to our nation, whether our nation rises or falls, will be like those billions and billions of Christians that have lived over the last 1,980 something years standing firm in hostile times. And we'll bring joy to our Savior, amen? amen. As we do what? As we follow him. Amen. So just keep following him. Father in heaven, um, I just thank you for your word tonight. I thank you for the family time that we've had, Lord. I thank you for, for the opportunity to, to gather around Stephanie and be a part of the work that you're doing there in, in Paris. I thank you, Father, for, for the word, your word tonight that fits right into the gaps in our life, Lord, strengthens us and steadies us and sends us back out to our mission field tonight and tomorrow where we get to serve you and we get to love people for you 
We get to learn from others and we get to train some others, Lord. We get to help some people stand. And so, Lord, tonight, would you pour out your spirit upon us and refresh us and and use us for your glory. In the strong name of Jesus, amen. 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 I left some stuff out tonight, but I can't wait to share it with you next week. I tell you, let's stand together. Amen. Amen. If you need to uh, hang around and pray with somebody, then grab one of the brothers or sisters. If you're looking for, uh, maybe what I talked about, uh, the, you're looking for a mentor, or you're a strong Christian, and you realize, i got to start pouring into somebody else. Make that the, the point of prayer for you in the next couple of days. And say, Lord, show me who you want to connect me with. And, and God will do that. If you're hungry to grow and you're hungry to give, he's, gosh, he's not going to miss that opportunity. God is going to set that up for you. Grace and peace to you. Grace and peace. Did I say that right? Close enough? All right. All right. Bless you. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495. Set free.